Italian Renaissance. In the years stretching from the late 1300s through the early 1600s, the cultural center of Europe was Italy. This period of cultural advancement and activity is known as the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a time for great advancement, not only in the theater, but in all of the arts. It is during this period that theater was transformed from its medieval form to a type of theater much closer to our modern style. Much of the new theater activity resulted from the merchants sponsoring artists to create works of art such as plays for the enjoyment of their family and friends. This system of providing financial support was known as patronage. The subject matter of the arts changed from the religious topics which had been dominant in the Middle Ages to more earthly matters and is focused upon human rather than divine activity. This new way of looking at the world was known as humanism. Neoclassical ideals. The new Renaissance rules of writing drama known as the neoclassical ideals were very important because they dominated opinions about the best way to write plays for over 200 years. The neoclassical theories were based upon then recently rediscovered writings of the Greek and Roman playwrights and the writings of the Greek philosopher Aristotle. The Renaissance writers thought they had found the rules about the proper th way to write and create theater. So they created plays that copied the stories and themes of the Greek and Roman plays. The neoclassical ideals were concerned with what is called verisimilitude, which means being true to life. Verisimilitude is what the Renaissance playwrights mistakenly believed that Aristotle was dictating. Therefore, the Renaissance philosophy demanded that all characters and situations be recognizable and verifiable from real life. To make sure that this rule of verisimilitude was followed, all plays had to have a unity of time, requiring that the action of the play not cover more than 24 hours, unity of place, requiring that the action all take place in one locale, and unity of action, requiring that the plot only have one storyline with no subplots. In some Renaissance theaters, such as that of Elizabethan England and Spain's golden age of drama, the neoclassical ideals were ignored, but most European countries followed the rules of verisimilitude. Changes in space and style. During the Renaissance, changes and discoveries in visual art had a major effect upon the arrangement of space and visual imagery inside the theater. Italian artists discovered how to use angles and variation in the size of objects represented in the same painting to create the illusion of depth or a sense of realistic three-dimensional space. This was called perspective painting. The use of perspective in paintings replace the medieval practices of painting which made images seem flat. Some of the most important people in theater history in this period were architects who changed forever the way theater buildings would be built. In the early 1600s architects first began to design proscenium arches or picture frame openings around the stage space. The oldest surviving theater from this period is located in Vicenza, Italy and named the Teatro Olimpico. It was completed in the year 1585 and could hold up to 3,000 people. Although it had no proscenium arch, the stage had a permanent facade, fake building front built on stage to represent a large building, which reflected this new concern with visual perspective. Like the Roman scene houses in the earlier period, the Olympico's facade had a series of doorways built into a massive ornate wall that could be used to represent the households of various families in the plays. These doorways were different from their Roman counterparts in that they had long hallways or alleyways built into them. These alleyways ran at sharp angles away from the audience giving the illusion of deep interior spaces within the homes of the play's characters. The concern with perspective was to soon change the use of the facade. The facade gave way to the use of painted scenery, which could be shifted to reveal new settings behind it. Soon painted flats, painted canvases representing three-dimensional walls, were replacing fixed architectural stage houses as the basic unit of scenery.
This change is what made building proscenium arches popular. The arch gave audience members the sense that they were looking at a walking, talking, moving, transforming, singing painting when they went to the theater. In the Middle Ages, the style had been to use mansions to represent heaven, hell, earth, and other specific settings, all visible to the audience at the same time. In the Renaissance, it was much more popular to reveal only one setting at a time. This made it necessary to hide from view all the flats except the one being used at a given time. The proscenium arch was the solution. While serving as a huge picture frame, it also hid the extra flats and the system of ropes, pulleys, and tracking needed to move the flats. As the period progressed, the audience began to want more and more changes of setting, which led to the building of permanent proscenium arches. The first theater to have a proscenium stage was the Teatro Farnese in Parma, Italy, completed in 1618. For the Farnese scenery, painters used perspective techniques to create a painted series of wings or flats, which were placed one behind the other on both sides of the stage so they could be slid away to reveal the next set. These flats usually appeared to be houses along a city street. The setting was closed off at the back of the stage with a painted drop, or a large set of wings called shutters, which met in the middle of the stage and could be slid away to reveal another backdrop. The use of these multiple settings required that newer theater buildings have more backstage space to store scenery and equipment. This meant that Renaissance stages became larger and larger and deeper and deeper to house all the scenery and to provide the visual depth that had become so popular in visual arts. Although the Italians were very concerned with perspective, they did not find it necessary to create new scenery for each play. Instead, they reused three standard styles of settings, one for tragedies, showing the street of a wealthy neighborhood, another for comedy, showing a common street lined with lower class homes, and a third setting for pastoral plays, showing trees, hillsides, and simple country cottages. The practice was to reuse these basic settings over and over, depending upon the style and genre of the play being produced. The first comedy written in Italian was La Casaria by Ludovico Ariosto. La Casaria is a comedy that combines classical form with a more contemporary sense of earthy humor. The first important tragedy was Sofonispa by Gian Giorgio Tresino.